Uh, thanks very much, Hamish. Thanks very much, Sophia. No, it's, it, it's amazing to be here. No, you really couldn't have picked a more terrifying location for the talk. Because <laughs> this is where I used to give Politics One lectures many, many years ago. No, and it's just amazing to be back, I suppose. When the book just came out a few weeks ago. And I felt, well, of course, now it's out after about 10 years of working on it. I want to go and discuss it. And I want to take it to Edinburgh, and I want to talk about it here. So I invited myself and Sophia and Hamish responded beautifully, so thanks very much. But what worries me is that I also made a promise by coming that when I told my friend Maggie here about the book, she said, yes, that's what we need, hope, because everything is so hopeless. No, that she really feels very hopeless. And I promise to come and to banish hopelessness and gloom from Scotland forever, <laughs> much in the same way as St. Patrick banished snakes from Ireland. No? So the problem is that I feel that perhaps that was a bit overambitious <laughs> and that I may not be able to do it. And I think that, yeah, the difficult, I may not be able to do it because of the hopeless times. We do actually live in hopeless times. <coughs> and the title of the book is Hope in Hopeless Times. And of course, I want everybody to focus on the hope, but the hopeless times are there as well. No, we know that we are in a catastrophic situation. We know that we are in a situation that is quite possibly taking us towards extinction. And if not as far as extinction, then certainly heading towards catastrophe in terms of global heating, in terms of the massacre of other forms of life, the slaughter of biodiversity, no? in terms of the rise of the right, the extreme right, in terms of tendencies towards war, possibly nuclear war. I mean, it is actually a very frightening time. And so that's what makes it difficult to fulfill my promise. But um, I, I think if we want to talk about hope, we can't just say, I mean, there's a tendency, if you think of hope, to say, Oh, we hope, we hope, we hope, and to go dancing around hoping. And I don't think we can do that, actually. If we want to talk about hope, we have to talk about the hopeless times as well. We're actually in a moment in which history is very clearly facing in two directions. One direction is towards catastrophe. The other direction, less obvious, is the enormous potential we have to create a different world. So when we talk about hope, we really talk about hope against, not hope for, not hope in. I mean, it's called hope in hopeless times. It might be better to have called it hope against hopeless times. It is hope that is directed against the society in which we live. No. Um, because the society in which we live, capitalism, is not only an unjust society, 
We're all very conscious of its injustice, its unfairness. We're conscious of the way in which poverty is increasing and the way in which social disparities are increasing. It's not only an unjust, nasty society, but above all, it is a, it's a society that has a certain dynamic of development. No? In other words, we can't just say, oh, well, we're fighting in the same way as our grandfathers, our grandmothers fought um, 50 years ago. It's not, we're actually in a different situation. The dynamic of destruction, the what capitalism means in terms of destruction is much clearer now than it was 50 years ago. So we're hoping against, our hope is directed against, it's against a dynamic of destruction. And I think that dynamic of destruction is constituted by money. It's not constituted by Sunak or the Tories or Biden or even Trump. It's actually constituted by the way in which we relate to one another. No. And in that, I suppose I follow the argument of Marx. I mean, Marx says, no, we relate to one another. The problem with capitalism is that we relate to one another through the exchange of commodities. No? Commodity exchange gives rise to money. We relate to one another through money. So it is hope against money because this relation through money is the starting point of a whole chain, dynamic chain. Money leads us on, to, of course, to capital. Capital leads us on to profit. The pursue, constant pursuit of profit means we know the destruction of the world around us. No? So once we start from commodity exchange, once we start from money, we enter into this logical dynamic of destruction. So if we're going to talk about hope, we are confronted with this awful problem of talking about hope against money, not just hope that somehow Corbyn will come back to lead the Labour Party to victory in the next election, but hope against money, hope against the existence of the rule of money, hope against the existence of a society dominated by money, that is to say, dominated by the pursuit of profit. Money, I focus on money rather than capital, not as opposed to capital, but it seems to me perhaps more helpful to talk about money Partly because I think we need to refresh our language the whole time. And the problem about capital is that it suggests an externality. Most of us, probably none of us here, has capital. It is something outside us. But if we talk about money as the basis of capital, then we all know, I assume, that everybody here will spend money between now and tomorrow evening. And we all know as well that money penetrates our lives, shapes our lives. It shapes what we are going to do. You know? If we finish studying, for example, and think what are we going to do next year, you know? then money is a consideration. Money channels our activity in a certain direction. No. We all may feel, oh, no, we're going to live without money. But it's 
pretty difficult to do. So the money actually shapes what we are going to do tomorrow, shapes what we're going to do next year, and the next, and the next, and the next, until we, <coughs> until we die. You know? So you can think of money as the great kind of channeler of human activity, which shapes what we do from day to day and shapes it in a way that contributes to the reproduction of the system that we are, that is destroying us, and that we are fighting against. No. So you can think of money, in a way, as the great container of social activity. I mean, it always, always seems to me extraordinary that in discussions of power in sociology or politics, people don't really mention money, generally. Whereas we know that, in fact, money is the most concentrated expression of social power. So money is the great container of our activity or the great totalizer in the sense that it, it draws what we do from day to day into the totality of capital or social relations, into the totality of this destructive dynamic. So if we want to talk about hope, if we want to talk about hope, then somehow we have to say, kill money. And that seems insane. And it also means that we're moving into a language that many of us have come to feel uncomfortable with. Because if we're saying kill money, let's abolish money, then of course we are talking about revolution. No. And I think that what's been happening over the last, what, 30, 40 years is that people have become more un have become uncomfortable about in talking about revolution. If we look back at the 20th century, we can see that the revolutions, or what were called, what were revolutions, were really disastrous in their consequences. No. I certainly, if I think of, say, Moscow in the 1950s or 1960s, then I think, oh, no, it's the last place I'd want to live. No. If we think about the Chinese Revolution, really, no. no. So because, I mean, it's not lots of us, there were lots of people of my age, I suppose, grew up with the idea the, of revolution as a concept, of revolution as being there, as being a kind of reference point to the way we think, to the way we, we thought. And I think in many cases, it's not necessarily that we suddenly say, oh no, that was a silly idea, but simply we gradually push it off the table or let it fall off the table as something that is not particularly significant. And we focus on other struggles. And focusing on other struggles may be very important. I'm not at all saying, not at all dismissing those other struggles. But there is a sense, perhaps, in which those other struggles are rearranging the deck chairs while the Titanic drifts towards disaster. And I'm not at all opposed to rearranging the deck chairs. We should sit as possibly as, as comfortably as possible. 
but we are still caught within this dynamic of destruction. We still know that the world dominated by money, a world dominated by the pursuit of profit, is very unlikely. I mean, we're in the middle of what, COP27. We know that it is failing, and we think, why can't they get it right? But we know also that they can't get it right because they are states that inevitably have to promote the accumulation of capital. They are inevitably subordinate to the logic of the maximization of profit. No? And it's not just cop. It, I mean, it's this whole dynamic that arises from the pursuit of profit, that is, from the rule of money that is pushing us closer and closer to catastrophe and causing untold destruction in the present. So then you think, well, how? How on earth? Kill money. It's easy. It's easy to say. It isn't actually easy to say. But if we say kill money, then we have to say, well, how on earth can we, can we do that? No? To go out and demonstrate tomorrow on Prince's Street with placards saying kill money or abolish money. This won't work. No? So how can we possibly think about getting rid of money as a social relation? It's also made more complicated by the fact that we all want money. We all want money to be able to eat well this evening, tomorrow. We all want money because we're worried about the security of our children, whatever. You know? We all want money. But probably nobody wants a society ruled by money. Nobody wants a society in which the dominant social relation is the money relation. No. So how can we think of, of, of that? How do we think of revolution today? I suppose this is really the theme. You know, Hamish mentioned that I see this book as being the third in a trilogy. The trilogy really has its main theme. How do we think, or is there a way in which we can think of revolution after the collapse, not only of the Russian and Chinese revolutions, but of the very concept of achieving radical transformation through the state? That didn't work. I think it cannot work. But we still know that we need to think about revolution. So how on earth can we think about revolution today? Or can we think? I mean, maybe we should be honest and say, well, no, that, it's just not possible anymore. Maybe it was possible 50 or 100 years ago, but maybe it's not possible. Not possible anymore, no. But if it's not possible anymore, then probably the best thing would be just to settle for capitalism and make it as comfortable as possible and forget about Marxism and forget about critical theory. No? So we're kind of confronted with this. No? I mean, today, can we still think about revolution? And yeah, I suppose the three books of the trilogy are really about that. I mean, the first one, Change the World Without Taking Power, is really about the need to think of revolution in a non-state-centered way. It doesn't go through the state. We have to think of it in other ways. The second book, Crack Capitalism, suggests that the only way to think about revolution is really here and now, by breaking with the logic of capitalist domination, by saying, here and now, 
what we are going to do, the way we are going to shape, shape our lives collectively or indeed individually is against the logic of capital. We will not go, we will not, we will walk in the wrong direction. No, you can think of that as taking place on a fairly massive scale as in the case of the Zapatistas or the Kurdish movement. Or you can think of it in terms of a smaller scale you know, with towns that declare themselves to be anti-capitalist and try and create something different. Or you can think of it in terms of a small scale, I mean, of students getting together and saying, well, you know, after I finish my degree, I really don't want to sell my life to capital. I want to do something else. I want to do something that makes sense for me. And in all these ways, all of these will be contradictory because they're within a capitalist context. But in fact, if you think of why we're here tonight, then probably all of us in some way are involved in trying to create these cracks in the logic of capital. No? Um, and we, yeah, one way or another, you know, that's, what, that's what we're doing. That's why we come to a meeting like this, I think. Crack Capitalism was published in 2010. And the dreadful thing is that capitalism is still there. Yeah. And it reminds me there's a famous short story, which is supposed to be the shortest short story ever written. It's seven words in, in Spanish by a Guatemalan author, Augusto Monterroso. And the short story is, when she awoke, the dinosaur was still there. And I feel, yes, I mean, that's, that's where we are. I mean, you know, lots of people here who've devoted their lives to fighting against capitalism. No, and it's still, you know, but when we look around, the monster is still there. So we have to say, well, not enough, okay? All this thought, but it's not enough. It hasn't gone far enough, no. Cracks, yes, the cracks exist. The cracks probably are multiplying by choice and by necessity. No. People are saying, no, we can't live that way. And we understand the consequences of living that way. No, we will create something else. So the cracks are there. The cracks are, for me, still fundamental. They're really the basis of hope. But this book, is the granddaughter. The grandmother, of course, has changed the world without taking power. The mother is crack capitalism. And this is the granddaughter. And the granddaughter is a bit restless. And she says, well, yes, fine. No? Very good, what you said. No? Good, yes, change the world without taking power. Good, crack capitalism, but it's not enough. And the granddaughter, being a Mexican granddaughter, takes out her machete and tries to open up a new path through the confusion. And this new path may or may not, we're not quite sure where it's going. But basically what the granddaughter says is fine. Yeah, agree with all that. But 
we have to see, we have to think also that perhaps we have a strength that we cannot easily see. Not only that there are struggles there all the time that are not easily seen, but perhaps we have a strength that can only be seen through looking at the enemy. Okay. In other words, there, logically, if we're talking about a social antagonism between capital on the one hand and whatever we want to call it on the other, what do we call it, labor or work or creativity or humanity or just us, there is a social antagonism there. And that means that there has to be an interpenetration of the two poles of the antagonism. Now, it's very clear how money in penetrates us in the way we think, the way we act. But what about the other way around? Is there some way in which our struggles penetrate capital and make it weak? Is there some way in which our struggles penetrate capitalism and make it chronically possibly even fatally ill. No. And am I talking too much, Hamish? I'm talking too much. OK, I'm going to carry on. Is that OK? Yes, I'm going to carry on. Okay. So is there some way in which our struggles actually enter into money itself? No and constitute the fragility or the weakness or the illness of money as a social relation. And there I take my cue from an article published by Tony Negri in the 1960s, where he says Cain Keynesianism, the Keynesian welfare state, is a reaction to the Russian Revolution. No? The Russian Revolution reflects itself in the fear of the most intelligent capitalist thinkers. No? There is a more recent book by Jeff Mann called In the Long Run, We Are All Dead, where he says, well, Negri, no, it's not exactly that. In fact, what Keynes was afraid of was the rabble. No. And in fact, if you look at Keynes's general theory, just in the last pages, he says, the world will not much longer tolerate present levels of unemployment. So that there is this fear there, the fear that actually enters into capital, fear that actually enters into money itself. It was expressed very clearly as well by a Democrat senator in the US when they were talking about uh, abandoning the gold Standard. This was under Roosevelt in the 1930s. And what Bernard Baruch, this senator, said was, you do not realize it yet, but with this measure, the mob is entering into the heart of capital. And I think he's right. I think they're all right. I think that there is a way in which the fear of the mob or the fear of the working class, the fear of the rabble, forces a separation between money and gold. First, it, with the abandonment of the gold standard in the 1930s, and then later in 1971 with 
the abandonment of the Bretton Woods system. No? Again, after the huge rise of social discontent that we associate with 1968, after all the anti-war movements in the States and throughout the world, after the huge struggles by the Vietnamese themselves. These are the forces that break the relation between gold and money. And after that, money liberated from its attachment to gold expands and expands and expands through debt. I mean, there's a huge takeoff of global debt from the early 1970s onwards. Or there is a huge growth of fictional capital. The existence of capital becomes more and more fictional. What is being accumulated is not surplus value produced, but what is being accumulated is the claims, the monetary claims on this surplus value, which is really not being produced sufficiently in spite of all the technological achievements. You know? um, and this really takes off. So you get this huge development of fictional capital which, fictitious capital, which expresses itself in the growing fragility of the world monetary system, which expresses itself in a growing stagnation as well of the world monetary system. And all the time, it's, it's the, I mean, we tend to talk all the time of the crisis of capitalism. And yes, but in fact, it seems to me these last 40 years, or at least until last February, were characterized by a constant postponement of the crisis. No? We postpone the crisis because we are afraid of the consequences of confronting the masses. We are afraid of the consequences of reducing debt. You know? um, of course, there has now been a change since March. You know? There has been a sharp change in monetary policy led by the Federal Reserve in the United States and by all the central banks. And it's not clear yet how far this will be taken. But there is, you know, with every kind of half point or at the moment 0.75% increase in the rate of interest, there is a very conscious gamble. You know? Can we raise the interest rate by half percent? or 0.75% without causing social chaos throughout the world. No? And that's what they've been pushing, and it's, at the moment it's just not clear how far they can push it. So, to conclude, I know Hamish said 20 minutes, and in Mexico, we have a flexible concept of time. No? Okay, so the granddaughter takes out her machete and she hacks her this new road and she's confident, yes, this is actually a different way of talking about hope. What is not clear is exactly where it leads us or where it leads us in terms of, of political action. I think where it leaves us is, firstly, I suppose to say, look, we are the crisis of capital. The crisis of capital is not because of its internal contradictions. We, the crisis of capital, is its inability 
to exploit us sufficiently to ensure its own reproduction. We, our resistance in the process of work, our resistance at a social level in terms of refusing to lie down and die from poverty, in terms of refusing just to convert ourselves into robots, in terms of refusing to eliminate totally the idea of critique from education. It is this resistance that is there all the time. And that may not be politically conscious in any sense. I mean, I think of it as being not just insubordination in terms of we refuse, but also simply non-subordination when we say, well, no, we can't. We're going to go home early. I, my back is sore today, and anyway, I'm not able to, to, to deal with these computer programs, and I'm not able to, to improve my English. Sorry, you know? So it's this kind of lack of total subordination to capital. Lack of, because capital, the very existence of capital, demands more and more and more of us all the time. And that's the point about value being determined by socially necessary labor time, is that capital is a system of requiring more and more and more in terms of exploitation. No? And we don't do it. And to some extent we refuse, and to some extent we're just too stupid or too incapable or too fond of other things. So I think that that, will, that means that we're actually much more stronger than, much stronger than we seem. No? We're used to thinking of the present situation in terms of total defeat for the last 40 years. And I just don't think that's true. I think it's much more an impasse. It's much more a situation where capital, okay, we may feel defeated, no, in lots of very palpable ways, but it is also true that capital is being defeated as well. No, it's possible for the two things to happen at the same time. Okay, so that's one point in the conclusion. Second point is, of course, abolish money. And somehow we have to say that. I mean, it, it, that, that's, I mean, I think if I could find a way of getting people to say that, it's very difficult to say. I mean, even talking to friends, it's difficult to say, well, let's just abolish money, no? And somehow, but somehow, we all know that it's true. We all know what money means in terms of our personal lives, in terms of our expectations of what we can do tomorrow or do for the rest of our lives. And we all know that it is the power of money that is driving global warming, that is driving the, 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 the destruction of, the, of biodiversity, that is taking us closer to the possibility of war. It is the drive of money as the social force that rules society. And we have in some way to say, get rid of money as a social relation. We really shouldn't, shouldn't be relating to one another in that way. And of course we don't. I mean, we do and we don't. We do. Of course, we'll go to the shops and buy some food in the next day. But when we come here, we don't. That's not what we're doing at the moment. We're not relating through money. And actually, our practice every single day, in terms of friendship, in terms of love, comradeship, in terms of doing things that are meaningful to us, is we say, no, we won't relate through money, we will do things in a different way. And sometimes it feels that doesn't get anywhere. But if we relate that 
to the actual fragility of money, the current fragility of money in a, a world level, then I think we can begin to say, yes, let's get rid of money. Let's think about what that would mean. Let's think and let's remember, perhaps, that this was something that really wasn't all that radical before. Let's get money out of education. Let's get money out of healthcare. No? And then the big challenge, perhaps, is let's get money out of food provision. In fact, let's get money out of access to food. And that is done in emergency situations and famine situations. You know, lots of money, is, lots of food has flown, in, flown into places that are starving so that people can have access to food. Well, why not say, yes, that's right. You know, let's get money out of food provision. No. And one... One thing that we're likely to see, I suppose, in the next, I think very likely to see in the next two or three years is a huge increase in rioting in the world. Um, I think the central bankers are very aware of that. If they raise the interest rate by half a percent, then what is it? There are seven, at the moment, I think, 72 states that are on the edge of default. What raising an interest rate by half percent means is that probably hundreds of thousands will die of starvation. And it means that there are going to be drastic cuts imposed, probably through the IMF, but the IMF isn't the problem. The problem is the rule of money. No. And it is very likely that in the same way as we saw in Sri Lanka a few months ago, or the same way we saw in Colombia a year ago, or in Chile three years ago, or in Greece in 2008, 2011, or in Argentina, 2001, 2002, and in lots of other cases, it is very possible that there will be an upsurge of riots. No? The question is, the riots will almost always, I think, be turned against the government of the day. But somehow we have to say, well, no, it's not. OK, the government of the day. It's probably disgusting and revolting and corrupt, but that's not the point. The point is to break the discipline that the existence of money means. And how do we say that? I don't know. I think we have to say it. And really, that the future of the world depends on it. Okay, we're going to have more and more demonstrations after this. COP27, there will be more and more demonstrations. We hope more and more young people coming out and saying, no, you're destroying the world. And at some point, well, people are already saying, but, but somehow it has to become generalized, saying, well, the only way to stop this destruction of the world is to break the rule of money. So thank you very much. <laughs>
basically, I think of what you want to say, and I would agree, is, is that hope exists. Yeah, that, that even in, in a seemingly depressing world, hope exists. Um, in, in the sense that, that, there, uh, that a, a, a principle of hope or a hope principle exists. And how can I say that? Because, and I think John agrees with me in this too, that, 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 that um, because we <laughs> exist, you know, that, that hope is what we actually are. We're moving beyond or trying to move beyond whatever it is that we find ourselves in. Um, and and, and that, that the very fact that there are people sitting here listening to these words and to what, what John has said suggests that hope exists um, in, in quite in a strong sense. Now, I would add in to that that, of course, there, there's a catch in the situation, which is that hope exists, but in the mode of being denied. Yeah? Um, and, and now, I, I think that, that hope exists, but in the mode of being denied catches it quite, quite exactly. Because what I'm saying, I think, and what John is saying is that a, a, a hopeless world, or a world where there is no hope, does not exist. I mean, it, 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 I mean, oddly enough, we are trying to sort of say that hope exists. But actually, it's the other side that we are saying that hope, hopeless world does not um, it, it exist. And when I say that hope exists in the mode of being denied, let me be as clear as I can about that. Just to, 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 to say that, um, that the element of denial is, is very important in, 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 in my meaning there, that uh, um, it, it's not a matter of we look out the window on a grey day and there's no sunlight and it, it all looks a bit depressing and such like, and, and we say, oh, there's no hope, I don't see any hope there, it's, it's, it's just going to be a grey day once, once, once again. Um, but the notion of hope being denied means that hope is being denied, someone is saying no to, to hope and, and trying to stand in, in, in as opposed to, to, to hope. Um, and that, that, um, the, the, the element of denial, um, that big people say things like, oh, you know, socialism is impossible or, um, or whatever. The, 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 the way in which hope is denied almost always, I think this picks up on, on other things that John has been saying, is, is that, um, it's when problems about um, money are brought into to focus, and that is the terminology for hope denial. Yeah, it, 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 it's um, the, the, the question about can socialism exist? There's a whole con um, literature, a whole lot of arguments about um, how a, 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 a pricing policies might be decided by a socialist. Um, government now, you can um, sort of think about is, is that really a real problem or not? I don't know, but people do go on about about that. Um, and and so the, the terminology of of um, monetary denial and the terminology of of of, of, of property and, and and money which goes together with property are are the terms in which hope. Is denied. Now, I, all I've been trying to do there is to, what I see it, as I see it, sim summarize what, what um, John has been, been saying. I'll, I'll, I'll stop at that point. I mean, I've got a further point I could go on about, but never mind about that. That'll do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just there's this wonderful, I can't find it, there's this wonderful bit where John quotes like four or five financial times journalists in a row each of them kind of panicking about the degree of fragility in the contemporary financial situation. And that was by far my, the, the, the final couple of chapters where you really excavate the degree to which the last 40 years have seen capitalism get to a point where it's teetering in ways that are really, uh, I, I, I think the thing that struck me about it is that we often think about the same things with a position of power. So I, I, you know, you read so much about the power of debt, the way that debt is inscribed in all social relations. We're all slaves to debt. We are all beholden to a world of debt. And John just sort of says, yeah, 
but just look at it from a slightly different angle. And the debt itself is remarkably fragile, and it's fragile because we've made it fragile, ultimately. It's a really, I think, a beautifully, it's a beautifully made argument. Anyway, I'm, I, I'm not going to say too much more, I don't think. Um, yes? Is that the question? Do you want to? Do you want yeah, to pass? All right. Uh, thanks, John. It's great to see you here again. And um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, your focus on hope uh, is a complicated matter because, I mean, you were also talking about the revolution and the fact that it's not imaginable anymore. And it is the concept of revolution it is now uh, very difficult to, to define. Now, hope in principle, of course, belongs to a radically different register from the register of revolution and other terms from, uh, you know, let's call it emancipatory politics. Now, I would like to ask you whether you could reflect upon, because, you know, hope oh, is very problematic also from the point of view of the kind of subject that underpins it, which historically has been a basin not an agent, a suffering being who hopes, you know, mm. suffering stops. Obviously, this is a religious register that, um, as far as we are concerned, is totally contrary to an investigatory register. So um, I would like to ask you whether you will, I mean, I haven't had occasion to read your book yet, but uh, whether you will qualify the hope you are talking about as I will qualify it, the one I will talk about if I were going to focus on hope, as a militant hope. <laughs> militant hope. Then I find another problem in what you were saying because you were referring to a hope that is hope against. And here again, I agree that there is a fundamental aspect of that hope that to me if it is valuable will have to be a militant hope that it is negation, rejection of what there is of the total disastrous catastrophic world in which we live as you described it which I couldn't agree with this is necessary to reject it but if we don't have an affirmative stance so mm -hmm. that after the negation, in whatever form negation, rejection, whatever, uh, we will remain there. And we have been there so many times that after saying no, we don't want this, and being all together or many together, then there are splits, then the thing doesn't go further. Because we don't have an affirmative stance that, you know, what afterwards? You, know, you were talking a lot about the, uh, uh, the abolition of money, but. Fine, I totally agree, but what do we have instead of that? Because I suppose that you are not advocating, you know, going back to the barter economy, which anyway, uh, it is still exists because uh, it's part of. So, but the two questions are, hope is, it belongs to a radically different register. Will you then uh, qualify your, the hope you're talking about as a militant hope? And then what about, you know, the confining this hope to the denial, which is necessary, fundamental, but it's not a Yeah, no, I think that's very important. Um, I think I'm very conscious of kind of lots of people, lots of friends saying, well, why do you want to write about hope? Hope is such a cliche. Hope is such such a cliche in all electoral politics, for example, there is no political party that does not talk in terms of hope. And obviously I'm saying no, that's not what I'm interested in. It is really hope against the destructive power of money, of capital. In that sense, hope against, yes, means hope directed against capital, in that sense, militant hope, if you like, but not necessarily consciously militant. Now, I suppose for me, militant implies some sort of consciousness. And my argument would be that we always also do it unconsciously. Yeah. 
No? Um, there is one, I haven't mentioned them, I think, but I'm inspired, of course, by Ernst Bloch's Principle of Hope, no? his wonderful book on hope of three volumes, where he really interprets the whole of culture in terms of hope, in terms of this pushing forward. To, uh, this expression of that which does not yet exist, the power of that which does not yet exist. No. Now, one of the things he says there right at the beginning of his book is that hope is in love with success. And I suppose I'm saying, OK, if hope is in love with success, then let's really think about how it can break the constructive dynamic, the destructive dynamic that is shaping the world. On the question, what money for me means above all alien determination, determination of our activity, determination of our lives by a force that we do not control, that nobody controls. To be against money as alien determination means that what we hope for is self-determination. That then would be your, your affirmative side, I suppose. Yes, to fight against money is to fight for self-determination, which has to be collective in one way or another. No? And that is what is happening at the moment in so many struggles that say, no, we won't let a mine be opened or fracking be opened in our locality because that we want to determine what our, our society or our community would look like. So I think of... of um, of the affirmative side of, of hope, if you like, in terms of the push towards self-determination, the push towards self-determination, which has to be collective. I also, there's also an expression that Bloch uses that I like a lot, where he talks of the utopian star. Okay? So we don't have a clear idea of where we're going, and our ideas about the society we would like to see really grow out of the struggles all the time. So they keep on changing. But what we do have is some sort of utopian star that guides us. You know? Some sort of concept of what it would mean to live in dignity. And there is Richard's go back to Richard, his great, um, great expression, which I use a lot in the book as well, is the idea of mutual recognition. What we want is to create a society of, based on the mutual recognition of our dignities. No? So, yeah, that for me would be the the affirmative sign. Yeah. Um, before I kind of, uh, 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 there's a lot of people who have asked questions, so I, I am keen to, Emma, are you okay? Yeah. Do you want to? Of course. Jump in. So yeah. um, this isn't going to take long, don't worry, but Emma and Callum are going to mm -hmm. give us some kind of practical examples of how they, they, the things they are organizing on a local level um, are, are kind of embodying or building hope, I guess. Or whatever you want to say. Great. Amazing. Uh, hello. Um, I was going to start first maybe by saying that it was quite funny when you reminded me about us, about the book Crack Capitalism, because I remember going to the Materialist Conference 10, 12 years ago and reading that book and being like, it's great, but I'm angry about it. Um, it's not enough. Um, and so it's really nice seeing the continuation of it and like that dialogue etc um, and I think the other thing I wanted to say is in a way um, 
it feels like it's really useful for people not to be hopeful. And it's really, really useful for us um, to, like, for capital to make us feel hopeless. Oh. And um, that actually, like, being hopeful feels like a natural condition. We're hopeful for what's going to happen next. We're hope like, it feels like it's part of ourselves and that we should just reclaim that just as we can reclaim our own power of like, yes, it's very, very useful to make us feel hopeless. Um, and how do we actually support each other collectively to feel hopeful um, and empowered? And so um, I'm here from Living Rent, which is Scotland's tenant union. Uh, we're based in Edinburgh, we're based in Glasgow, we're growing in Dundee, in Aberdeen, um, in the Highlands. I was just on the phone with someone from the Western Isles. Hopefully something will happen there. Um, and I guess where I find what we do hopeful um, is that we're trying to win stuff and we're looking at small victories and we're remembering that we can win stuff. We can win stuff for our individual housing situation. We can win stuff in our neighborhoods. Uh, that might be street lights, that might be toilets, that might be a fight against a local development. Um, and we can win stuff nationally. And that's a rent freeze just now, of an eviction ban. And so again, it's all these things that we're told we can't do. You can't win a rent freeze. That's not possible. It's like, why not? Like, <laughs> let's do it, let's try it, and let's tell me why not. Um, and so I think it's been both about winning victories such as these, but also like learning how to do things together and winning that sense of collective organization. How do you chair a meeting? How do you do a negotiation? How do you go speak to strangers at 7 p.m. in front of their door to talk about issues that they care about in their neighborhood? How do we listen? And so I think that's the things we try and practice is both victories um, and getting used to winning again and feeling entitled to win, being hopeful to win and practicing that and processes that enable us to do that collectively. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Emma. Uh, Callum, do you want to try and follow that? <laughs> I'll try. Uh, I'm involved with the Edinburgh Anti Rates Group. Um, anti Rates. So, do you want me to stand up? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm Calm. I'm involved with organising uh, Edinburgh Anti Rates. Uh, basically, our uh, principle is to raise awareness of immigration rates that do happen in Edinburgh and to organise community resistance to them. The, this group was pretty much founded on the principle of hope against a like, hopeless society because it was it was put together. There was a group of people that put it together. I wasn't quite involved from the very beginning. Um, in the wake of the 2019 election, so there was a lot of people that were on the left um, who were not previously involved really in parliamentary politics, but kind of got behind the Corbyn campaign because they thought it might create necessary openings for kind of more radical politics. And then when it was a kind of thumping, you know, 80 seat Tory majority, we realized things are gonna get a lot darker and that's when we need to actually practice hope in the present of getting together to resist like the more the inevitable, more draconian um, home office policies. Um, and that was that was the kind of founding principle and the way that it kind of is kind of enacted in the process is you know we're creating all the literature the to do with it. And also just going out and speaking to people, and speaking to people beyond the kind of money relation. Because it's when we're out on the stalls, speaking to people, so explaining that there are raids on, on businesses, on flats for people, um, that are, 
that are just trying to live their lives here and they, they don't realize it's happened. And when they're confronted with this, they say, I can't believe this is happening just next to me. These, these are just human beings that are just trying to you know, live their lives. So when they realize that, they, they, they kind of, it does kind of force them to um, think about their relations with the people around them in a different way. We have to. We go into you know shops to speak to them to kind of raise awareness, and they and they, you know, they, they see stuff that happens on their streets, um, and you know how they look out for each other um, against these kind of more repressive um, state forces. And of course, this kind of all culminated um, when there was the attempted raid on the restaurant just a few hundred meters away from here. I'm useless to the geography, so I can't figure out what direction it is. But um, when someone spotted, is it that way? <laughs> um, so someone spotted the van, and immediately people crowded around it. We put out the call in the WhatsApp groups that was that were kind of created by us through the stalls, and hundreds of people came out, and they stopped that van from moving. But they they had to. They had to release the people that they had detained, which was completely arbitrary. Like they went in there without a warrant and um, tried to detain them, but hundreds of people came out. And we realized that we could actually stop things with just our bodies, you know? And it was in those moments that, you know, that's when we feel like we can actually change something and um, block the forces of um, capital. Um, and yeah, I think that's yeah. I think that, that it kind of increases our kind of horizon of possibility, and I think that's why it's important to actually um, kind of get out there and meet people and realise that collective action does um, it can have an impact. It can actually change people's lives. I think that's all I have to say. Um, just, just really quickly, the thing I find amazing is that, I mean, part of the reason why I asked those two, it's not only just the great people, uh, but if you told me 10 years ago that there would be an organisation that managed to win a rent freeze from the Scottish Government, I would have said impossible. If you told me 10 years ago there'd be an organisation that would bring out hundreds of people with like 10 minutes notice to stop state immigration raids in Edinburgh, I would have said impossible. And I wouldn't have been being cynical. You all would have agreed. We'd have said, yeah, that's unlikely. And yet here they are. It does happen. Anyway, um, uh, OK, so we've done the sparks a whole bit. Hopefully, that made you think a little bit. We can now return to questions. Um, yeah. I think on, on law, I think of it as a bit like money. It's a containment, a container. Um, the law defines, you know, it creates rules. It channels action into certain um, channels into certain um, paths within those rules. Oops. And part of my, there is a phrase that I love that I take from Raoul Van Egem, where he talks about revolution as the poetry of overflowing. And I suppose my feeling is that no, that really anti-capitalist action or anti-capitalist possibilities really have to be thought of in terms of a constant overflowing, a constant breaking of definitions, a constant breaking of, of classifications which is not at all to say 
that when, within the legal framework or within existing societies that you can't do important things through law and legal struggle. I think you can, but there is perhaps a way in which one has to challenge not only the content of laws, but the legal form, you know, the form of law as, as, as this process of classification that comes from above. You know. um, the second question about the responses of the state to these riots, I think it's very important. It's very, very interesting. Um, obviously, one response, and usually the initial response, is, is violence. You know? um, if we think of the Chilean uprising of October three years ago, there, um, I don't know how many hundreds of people lost their eyes, literally, because of the way in which the police were shooting rubber bullets at them. Um, on the other hand, there is also a very interesting response that we get in Argentina in 2001, 2002, that we get in Greece, 2008, 11, that we get in Chile, that we get now in Colombia, is of course the, much a very different response, a response that institutionalizes the protests, that draws them into the state and basically neutralize. I mean, they make some improvements, but the protests are, are neutralized in that way. Um, and then, yeah, so I think that something that I suppose we're trying to think a lot about at the moment in, in Puebla, where I work, is just how you understand that process and how, how to think about it and how to respond to it. Um, yeah, that's... Monetary. I don't know if they can hear you at the back, Colin. Sorry. Um, when you were talking in, in terms of the monetary uh, aspect, you didn't mention the word redistribution at all. No. Was that deliberate? And, and if so, why? I think that the problem, firstly, yeah, I mean, redistribution can be important. All left wing governments, in a way, are committed to some sort of redistribution. They very rarely achieve it. They may achieve it to some extent. Um, but the forces of the need to attract capital to your territory means that there is not an awful lot that you can do in the way of redistribution. But secondly, and mainly, I didn't talk about redistribution because I think that's not the main issue. Or it is an issue, of course, that's important. But what I want to say is, no, we have to think of money as the way in which we relate to one another. It's a very peculiar way to relate to one another. I don't relate to you through money or to George or to, no. It, it's actually a peculiar way to, to relate to one another. But it is a form of relation that comes to dominate the whole world. And that's how, that's what somehow we have to break. And redistribution doesn't address that. I mean, I think within capitalism, there are all sorts of ways in which probably society can be improved. Partly in terms of redistribution, partly in terms of social services, partly in terms of, I don't know, services for the disabled, recognition of, 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 of different groups, all sorts of ways. But it is all within this context of a drift or more than a drift towards catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we have to address in some way. Mm -hmm.
Uh, on the first point, yes, I think what you say is important. I think that I already mentioned Richard's idea of mutual recognition. You know? I think that what we actually do in our daily lives, in many, many different ways, we push against money. You know? If we're teachers, then we are, our relations to the students are not actually, of course, money is there as a force, but that is not what we are primarily involved in. I think we're trying to do things in a, a different way. The same with caring. No? Um, I think the, the idea of a relationship of care is an expression of the power of our refusal to allow money to penetrate everything. We know that over the last, what, 30, 40 years, we have witnessed, I suppose, this penetration of money and money criteria deeper and deeper into our lives in many ways. But we also fight against it and try and do things in a different way. Um, no, and the, yeah, that for me is, is kind of very important because if we talk about hope in terms of the force of the oppos our opposition to money, if we talk about hope in terms of the force of our excess, of our overflowing of commodity relations, then yes, those sorts of ideas come into it very much. On the question of theological hope, I, I would say no, no, really what I want is, um, I mean, of course, there's a theological development dimension, but the theological dimension usually points towards a life after death. And what I'm trying to say, no, if we don't hope, if we don't, struggle against the negation of hope, which is money, then maybe we'll all be dead and we won't know. <laughs> no, it's, not, it's really about realizing change now, but realizing radical, almost unimaginable change before it's too late. And I think this sense of urgency, which certainly I feel much stronger now than I probably did 20 or 30 years ago, I think this sense of urgency of the need for radical change may well be something that we see growing very much in the years to come. It, uh, sorry, um, just on that, uh, during the pandemic, everybody, politicians, scientists, everybody was saying, this pandemic shows us that after the pandemic is over, we must change the way that we live radically. But nobody in that context, as far at least of what I read, says, well, yes, we must get rid of money. That's really... What, what we need. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I hope this isn't counter, I don't think it is, but one of the things that has given me and many of the people I know the greatest hope over the time is to do with money, and that is the support there has been for unions. I mean, hugely broad support from people, you know, even the Vox Pop things where people say, you know, I never really agreed with unions or whatever. But I do agree with what they're doing, and it's partly that COVID shone a light on, you know, the kind of abuses of people's labour and, and all of that kind of thing. And um, there's a group called the Care Manifesto Group, Lynn Sida, and people know her, but they're tr she's trying, this manifesto group is trying to sort of stretch the idea of care, you know, to interdependence and all the rest of it. And it just seems to me that the kind of solidarity that has been shown 
And I think we'll actually grow more and more as people take strength action, even nurses, for God's sake, you know, the first time like over 100 years or whatever. Um, and I think that the idea of looking at that, uh, at that is not just solidarity, you know, amongst workers, but people who are striking is doing it for all of us. It's kind of, it's not a new idea, but it's kind of new in this sort of regime we've been in for such a long time. So I find that quite hopeful. Yeah, I think that's very important. Um, I think, yes, our struggles very often are centered around money. You know, we need more money. We need a redistribution. We need fairer wages for nurses or, or whoever. No. We need better conditions of employment. But I suppose what I think is if we want to, what we need to do is to overflow from that. No, I'm not saying, oh, we should just have revolutionary struggle. No, we can, reformism is a waste of time. No, the only way to actually reach the question of money is by overflowing from other struggles. No. Um, I mean, one thing that is clear, for example, um, in the case of union activity or in the case of strikes, is just what you mentioned. It's the growth of solidarity. And there are lots of situations, I think, in which the strikers, or certainly I seem to remember from the, the miners' strike when I was here in Edinburgh, um, you know, it's the idea that what is really created through strikes like that is a very different sort of relation between people, a different way of talking, a different for a kind of mutual recognition, you know, um, and, and you can find that in all sorts of struggles as well. I mean, in, 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 um, the one that leads to mind, I don't know why, was that in Bolivia, in Cochabamba, um, there was an important war of, of water in the year 2000, where people were fighting against the privatization of water. You know? And the one thing that they keep on saying, the people involved, was, you know, we learn to spend, to relate to other people in a different way to sit down with them and ask, well, how are your kids? Or, you know, in other words, our, our idea of social relations was transformed. Um, and I think that is the important thing of probably of any form of struggle. You know, um, Echoes a lot, <laughs> and, and it's not really a question, if that's okay. Great. Great. Uh, <laughs> it's more of a comment. Uh, so it was about that um, two things: that, that sense of hope as one of the multiple human emotions that we need to really celebrate and encourage with each other, of like solidarity, of grief, actually, like the grief of everything we're losing. Um, of um, anger and that um, anger that you're talking about in writing and I just wanted to share that when we do door knocking and when we speak to people like we encounter hopelessness all the time it's like why should I join the union what is it going to do for me you can't win we're never going to win we've not won nothing mm -hmm. and in those moments it's been really good to have stories of victories but there's also been a bit of a, what else are you going to do? Fine. Do you want to stay in a crappy home? Do you want to stay paying like, loads of rent? Do you, like, do you want to stay in that shit exploitation and like that moment of riling anger and entitlement I think is really, really important. And sometimes in the UK, I feel like we f we're afraid of our own anger. We're afraid that it's going to upset people. We're afraid that maybe some something is wrong is going to happen. It's like, well, are you going to stay in that shit place? <laughs> are you going to try and do something about it? And there is that 
I guess I, I'd like us to in, like to encourage ourselves to be angry and entitled as well as helpful. Yeah. Is that what? Yeah. No, I agree completely. When I talk about hope in the book, the first part of the book I think is called hope rage. No, I mean hope and anger are really inseparable. I think. I'm going to exercise the prerogative of having the mic myself because I, I was very glad that I don't know your name, either you raised the issue of unions because we, um, we're facing strike action here at Edinburgh next week and there's been a historic um, nationwide uh, ballot for strike action among members of the universities and colleges union. Um, but I guess, so, so that's quite a historic moment. And one of, the one of the strange and perhaps discomforting things that's happened to our union over the last um, couple of years is that it's adopted a class politics to talk about university workers as workers and, um, and bosses as bosses. And I think I've, I've encountered quite a few colleagues who are rather uncomfortable with that language. But it, it, it's, it, it is kind of creating new space. And of course, that um, language appeals um, or, or works most well for those casualized staff who are on temporary contracts and hourly pay and so on. So that is an important moment to, for a uh, union representing university workers to be talking uh, in terms of, the, of class politics. Uh, I, I think that we see that more broadly and, and actually I was quite struck by just over the last few months with the various strikes that have gone on, um, the RMT, the CWU, um, there has been the reinsertion through those struggles <coughs> of language of class politics into national media. And it is very directed against the finance stuff. Because the finance people are saying, we can't afford a pay rise at the time of inflation. You've got, you're being irresponsible, you're being selfish. Um, and these union people, I mean, including ourselves, are saying, we need to live, we need to be paid. The, the, the finance stuff is bogus. <laughs> that was a comment, you know. <laughs> but um, anybody else? Yep. Can I just respond to that really quickly, almost from the book's point of view? Mm. You know, I think almost what you're arguing is that the financiers are right. <laughs> now, for the last 40 years or so on, capital has not produced enough surplus value in the, in the way the market kind of defined it, that if everybody did demand the dignity of the wage rises that we are obviously fighting for, it would cause a crisis. And that's either a very rational reason to refuse to listen to the unions, or it's really exciting. Well, John, thanks very much. Uh, never been to a talk you've done doesn't really talk deep thought, uh, but very much one. Um, so I've known John since the late 1970s, and I can even see a connection. Actually, I remember John that one of the first things you were involved in was a, a bus, uh, a bus worker strike in Fife, and of course, public service strikes inconvenience the public. And at that point, you actually made something that's really what you're talking about is why do bus drivers, instead of going on strike, continue to drive the buses but don't collect the fares? <laughs> uh, and really, that's a link background for what you're saying just now. But the, other, the other thing coming from, you know, my dad, I, 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 I share a lot of your politics, but I think so. Here's one thing, question. A lot of what you described quite rightly 
you know, is affecting capital and you know, we see, see back then. the banksters are looking and say, can we control things? And whatever you describe, I would say you know, is, is that sort of you know, resistance, either active or passive, is anger, resentment, and refusal. To me, that is slightly different from hope. There's a different level has to be achieved. I agree with you, money has to be abolished. But the hope does not, is not another step required. And that's people seeing how can we meaningfully reorganize social relations and so we do with money. What is the alternative? Until people have a conception of that in their heads, then there's another problem that anger, resentment, refusal, yeah, you know, we can, uh, will have the effect of this permanent stalemate and will not get forward. Yeah, I suppose it, I'm saying that we do actually, and we don't recognize it. We don't, very often we don't recognize it, but in fact we do have an alter, a concept of how society could be organized, you know. Just sitting down together for a meal or going out for a drink or whatever, it's, we create forms of sociality that are not determined by, by, by money. And in a way, it's a, it's a question of making the, con the, the connection between that everyday experience on the one hand and the force of that everyday experience and the more abstract notions of what money means. I suppose I think it's that that I'm trying to to say to say we which means thinking politically about everyday acts that we don't normally consider to be political. No? Um, and on the previous question, what I was going to say to Sophia's thing, I mean I'd forgotten all about the bus drivers, but no. Um, but um, I think the most not a strike I was involved in myself, but once I saw, there was, I was in Argentina and there was this strike in the university and the form that the strike took was that the students and the teachers just went out into the streets, blocked the streets and they were teaching and discussing anti-capitalism in the streets and I thought that was terrific. No? Yeah, I mean, it's all, but it really comes back, I think, to this idea of revolutionary potential. We have to think of it in terms of an overflowing um, from, from other situations. Um, I'd be interested in hearing a bit about it. The in your experience. I'd be interested in. Uh, I was I was very lucky to hear James Kelman last night uh, launch his book, and one of his books was a, a dialogue with Noam Chomsky, and you know John, Noam Chomsky's talked a lot about the um, the counter revolution of the Leninists and, uh, you know, cemented in Kronstadt and all this kind of stuff. And I'm, I'm interested, you know, he's a, he's a great advocate of anarcho-syndicalism and the Spanish Revolution in the 36-39, where I think in a lot of areas controlled by anarchists, they did abolish money. And I'm just, given your uh, connection with the Chiapas, you know, the, the autonomous uh, Zapatistas and this sort of thing, is this, is this actually taking place? And the thing in Rojava as well with this new concept of, well, it's not a new concept, it's an anarchist concept of de democratic uh, federalism, you know, from Guchkin and uh, the Kurds uh, having been quite strong Marxist Leninists, taking a, a, a total different path, you know, and the abolishment of money in Rojava, uh, the Chiapas and the experience in 1936 to 1939 uh, with the anarcho syndicalists in Spain. You know, is this, is this welding the future, to, welding the past to the future 
There's been experiments, and there's experiments as we speak uh, of anarcho-syndicalism and uh, abolition of money and the state. <laughs> I, yes, I suppose. Yes, I think so. Um, I mean, in, in the Zapatist area of Chiapas, they certainly try, have tried to reduce the role of money as much as possible. Um, I think in Rojava as well, you're quite right. And I think, yes, these are very important. It, it's a very important part of the process of trying to construct collective self-determination. Yeah. So, so yes. Yes. <laughs> Good man. Good man. Great stuff. All this money, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to tag you for a five, but actually... Uh, Good stuff. Hi, John. Yeah. You've always made me think. <laughs> uh, so this is quite a complex thing, isn't it? Abolishing money. Um, but it's made me think tonight when you're talking about, I suppose, Bretton Woods in the 70s, but how do you run out of something fictitious? How do you run out of something fictitious? <laughs> you know, so the credit's fictitious. It's, it's created. It's, it's created. All we get from well, politicians and elsewhere, we don't have any money. And but we know from the COVID that it can be created when it's needed. But what's really going ah. on is they're getting us to, um, you run out of something fictitious when people no longer believe in it. That's, that's one thing. So you can, you can conjure up the money because what you're asking people to do is to commit their lives to a future. <coughs> is that, is that, you know, so I'm thinking that we, so yeah, it's, it, it, we live in interesting times in the sense that all we ever hear is of, of they don't have the money. They don't have, are they saying they don't have command over labour anymore? Mm. Is that what they're telling us? So they're yeah. actually announcing it. Um, you know, put, it put it up all the time, we, we've run out. Yeah. How, how does that happen in, in the sense that it's a credit system? I, yes. Um, I think, yeah, the money thing is obviously, <laughs> and the idea of abolishing money and how we think that we could actually do it is complex. I think what has been happening, I suppose the argument is, yeah, what's been happening over the last 40 years, really since Bretton Woods, is that the, there has been a failure in the command over labor. You know? And in that sense, yes, there has been a huge expansion of debt. And this debt does not actually correspond to surplus value produced. In that sense, the reproduction of the system depends upon um, this fiction. Right? Now, there is a sense in which at the moment, I think really since about February, March, they're saying, well, we can't, we can't go on like that, no. And the economic commentators are talk about the last 40 years as being a mistake, no. Um, and with the, 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 the beginnings of the rise in interest rates by the Fed, there is this attempt to, 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 to reverse course. Um, and I think, yes, to some extent it's happening. What is very difficult to know, I think, is just how far they can take it. Because with each rise in the rise of in, rate of interest rates, they may succeed in controlling inflation, but they may also cause a massive unforeseen financial collapse has almost happened with the pension funds in Britain. You know? And they may also be provoking um, social unrest. Perhaps not in the United States, perhaps not in Britain, possibly in places that don't, don't matter, so, matter so much to them. You know? But I think there is that kind of gambling the whole time and very... It, it, 
kind of very aggressive, but at the same time careful calculation of whether they can bring this process under control. No. Um, and it's kind, I find it difficult to read, but all the time the, fin the financiers are talking about the pivot. And when the pivot will come, the pivot being the, the turning point where they stop raising interest rates because basically because it's, it's just too dangerous for the financial and the social system. Hi, sir. So, um, uh, hi, I'm, uh, I'm studying the uh, history in uh, university, and I have a, a kind of a silly question. I don't know if you want to respond to it. Because I'm from the East Asia area, and study here for, for the first master degree. And I found that it could be quite different that uh, the, 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 the environment of the societies is like quite different. Like I hear a lot of people talking about unions, talking about the strike. But uh, in my opinion, in East Asia, it's like more like um, um, an issue of entertainment. And I think people and the young generation is so into the kind of uh, surplus entertainment. And do you think that this kind of entertainment could get in the way of the like what we call the the, the fragility of uh, making make make money to be ab abolished, like because um, it makes me feel like sometimes um, students' activities or their lifestyles doesn't coincide with what they learn from the university or the uh, like academic skills of the series. So it made me feel like, um, could you respond to this kind of maybe um, phenomenon? I, I don't know. Yeah. No, I wonder about, yes, I think that's an important question. I mean, I've been living in Mexico now for years and I suppose, yes, I'm used to a context of, um, in which there is a very strong anti-capitalist tradition. Right? But if I think of, well, Asia, two things occur to me. One is the amazing success of this Japanese book on Marx. What's it? Does anybody know? I can't remember the author, but there is some. Hmm? There is some. Just in the last few weeks, I've read of this um, Japanese book. I can't remember the author's name, but basically it is on capitalism leading us to disaster. And apparently it's been a massive bestseller in Japan. Hmm? Ah, right, you know, yeah, more than a million. Okay, of course, it's, um, yeah, I think my book hasn't quite got there yet, but, <laughs> no? So there is that. There is also the reaction in, well, all over the world, it's the, the reaction to the pandemic or what is emerging after the pandemic is the, 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 the refusal of work, no? The great resignation, as they say in the States, are here. And in China, it's the, what are they called? Flat, not flat. Flat, lying flat. Lying flat, right. Um, you know, we're not going to go into that culture anymore. There is also, um, I don't remember where I saw it, but I'm sure I saw somewhere that the Chinese government itself has said, well, we need, six, I think, 6.5% growth per annum to ensure social stability. And I think they're not going to, most, not going to get it anymore. At least it seems to be. You know, so I think really every, and perhaps everywhere in the world, there is a sense in which 
this fictitious expansion of capital has been the price that capital has paid to ensure social stability. No? Um, okay, you're not getting richer, but at the same time, we're, we're keeping conditions livable, you know? And that is what has been ensuring social stability, together, obviously, with violent repression over the last 30, 40 years. You could say, well, that is perhaps why talk of revolution has disappeared, because it's been bought off by this expansion of debt. And the big question now is whether that can be maintained or whether we are going to see some sort of radical change in that direction, I would say, in all the world in the next two years. I don't know. Okay, I think we have to stop, I'm afraid, because it's 7.30 and that's what the poster said was the end of time. Um, thank you very much for some wonderful questions. Uh, thank you, John, so much um, for the book. I'm a cynical bastard and it still made me slightly hopeful, so it's <laughs> just impressive. Um, and thank you for the lovely talk. Um, that's it. No, thank you very much, Hamish, Sophia, and everybody. I think I'm learning to see this lecture theatre with new eyes. <laughs> <laughs>